And with that, I'll go ahead and welcome everybody to uh, today's uh, webcast on what the Hachette v. Uh, Internet Archive case means for the continuing practice of CDL. Uh, and I won't step on Kathleen's introduction too much, but just want to reiterate uh, how excited we are to have uh, this panel together to, uh, to address this conversation, sort of provide an overview uh, you know, of, of the case, uh, the Internet Archives appeal, um, and sort of what that means for CDL as a continuing activity, um, you know, that we, along with many others, um, want to ensure, you know, has a robust future moving forward um, and couldn't have a better panel uh, to uh, to talk about that today. Uh, and so uh, I will uh, go ahead and turn things over to Kathleen De Laurenti, who uh, will be moderating today's discussion and introducing our panelists. And we are thrilled to have uh, Kathleen moderate. She's the director of the Arthur Friedheim Music Library at the Peabody Institute uh, at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, and has done lots of work related to today's conversation, uh, not least of which is chairing the best practices for fair use and uh, music collections task force for the Music Library Association, uh, serving on the Copyright Education Subcommittee for ALA, uh, and in 2015, uh, winning the uh, ALA Robert Oakley Memorial Scholarship for uh, copyright research. And uh, on a slightly more tangential note, but more spark related, I'll also have to mention that uh, Kathleen served as the co lead of the reinvestment working group of sparks negotiation uh, community of practice, uh, and really, really helped to get that work uh, off and running uh, uh, on the spark side. Uh, so with that, Kathleen, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Nick. Um, we're really happy to have everyone here today. So I wanted to actually kick us off by introducing all of our speakers and panelists. Um, so we are joined today by Chris Freeland, the Director of Open Libraries at the Internet Archive. Um, Chris works in support of the organization's mission to provide universal access to all knowledge. Before joining the Internet Archive, Chris was an Associate University Librarian at Washington University in St. Louis managing Washington University Library's digital initiatives and related services. He holds an MS in Biological Sciences from Eastern Illinois University and an MS in Library and Information Science from the University of Missouri, Columbia. His research explores the intersections of science and technology in a cultural heritage context, having published and presented on a variety of topics relating to the use of new media and emerging technologies in libraries and museums. Um, Charlie Barlow is the executive director of the Boston Library Consortium. He joined BLC from the Associated Colleges of the Midwest, where he served as vice president for strategic initiatives and programs. An alumnus of the University of Chicago and Trinity College, Cambridge, Charlie previously held academic and administrative appointments at the University of Chicago and Roosevelt University. He serves on the boards of directors for the Association for Collaborative Leadership, Housing Choice Partners of Illinois and the National Public Housing Museum. Also joining us today is Kyle Courtney. Kyle is a lawyer and librarian. And um, actually, Kyle, what is your new title? Sorry, I am the Director of Copyright and Information Policy at Harvard. I wanted to make sure I had the right <laughs> one. Um, Kyle works out of the Harvard Library, where he works closely with the Harvard community to establish a culture of shared understanding of information policy and copyright issues among staff, faculty, and students. His Copyright First Responders Initiative is in its 10th year at Harvard, and he runs a parallel national network that has spread the program to libraries, archives, museums, and other cultural institutions in Alaska, Arizona, California, Nebraska, New Hampshire, Oregon, Rhode Island, and Washington. In 2020, he co-founded a new nonprofit organization called Library Futures, which empowers libraries to take control of their digital future. He is an internationally recognized speaker on the topic of copyright, technology, libraries, and the law. He holds a JD with distinction in intellectual property and an MSLIS. His writing has appeared in Politico, The Hill, Law Library Journal, and other publications. He co-authored the seminal white paper on controlled digital lending of library books, and his latest forthcoming work is In Copyright and Censorship, Historical Dangers of Licensing Regimes in the Digital Age by Cornell University Press. We also are joined today by Sandra Aya Enamel. She's the Program Director for Scholarly Communication and Information Policy at Yale University Library. 
At Yale, Sandra contributes to advancing openness by providing strategic insight, information, and resources on scholarly communication and open scholarship. She also consults with Yale researchers on using copyrighted materials and assist creators in protecting their own copyright. Sandra is the License Review Steering Committee Chair and provides input on licenses of all types for the library. Sandra collaborates with individuals and departments within the library and across campus. She's given numerous presentations on various aspects of copyright and scholarly communication. Prior to this role, she was the copyright librarian and contracting specialist for Yale University Library. Sandra is committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and is interested in the intersection of DEI and intellectual property. Sandra earned her law and MSLIS degrees from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Sandra has BAs in political science and psychology from the University of Michigan and an MA in international relations from the University of Ghana. So um, a very exciting list of esteemed colleagues talking with us today. We're gonna kick things off with an introduction um, from Chris Freeland, who's going to give us an update on where things are with the um, ruling in the Hatchet case and um, what the next steps are with the appeal from the Internet Archive. Thanks so much, Chris. Thanks, Kathleen. Hey, everyone. Uh, as Kathleen said in that uh, very generous uh, introduction, thank you for that. Um, I'm Chris Freeland, and I'm the director of library services at the Internet Archive. So if you've been to a webinar hosted by the Internet Archive around controlled digital lending, you've probably seen me talk at length about the library practice and the ways that libraries are putting it to use. That continues to be true um, in light of, or even in spite of, the decision against the Internet Archive and controlled digital lending in the, uh, uh, in the lower court, in the district court level, in March of this year. We said then that we believed uh, that the, the judge made errors in fact and law, the, that just got some things just plain wrong, and that we would appeal. And last month, we filed our notice of appeal. Now, I can't tell you what this decision means for your library, but I can tell you what it means for mine. In fact, we wrote a post uh, that aimed to clarify uh, what this decision and the resulting injunction means for all of the library, uh, Internet Archives library services. And in fact, I'm going to uh, paste that here into the chat now. So in short, the four publishers in the lawsuit, that's Hachette, HarperCollins, Penguin Random House, and Wiley, will send us the Internet Archive list of their commercially available ebooks. And if we have those in our library, we will remove them from lending. We can keep doing other library practices like interlibrary loan, text and data mining, providing services, uh, reader services for patrons with print disabilities, but no lending. The judge did side with the Internet Archive um, on one point and one very important point, and that's that the injunction only covers books with a commercial ebook, not the publisher's full uh, books in print or the backlist. We also came to a, a separate agreement with the Association of American Publishers, that's the AAP, they're the trade organization that organized the lawsuit, that they won't support further legal action against the Internet Archive if we follow similar procedures uh, for their member publishers. Um, so all of that work is happening in parallel with the appeal. Um, I want to make it clear that we're following the injunction while we're fighting the appeal. Um, the appeal process is going to play out over the next few months. So those of you who are docket watchers or who subscribe to Court Listener, by the way, that's how I find out information about what's happening with the case uh, on the public side as well. Um, you're going to be seeing new notices of activity this fall. So that appeal process is underway and it's moving forward. So as I, I wind down here with my brief remarks, I really just wanted to give some a high level cursory introductory uh, view into what how is this happening for uh, what's happening at the Internet Archive. Um, I'm going to I'm going to leave the rest to the experts uh, uh, on the panel. But here's what I want to leave uh, all of you with. The Internet Archive is still standing. We are certainly disappointed in the outcome of the lawsuit, but we are fighting on uh, for CDL because we have to. Libraries have to be able to own our collections and use our physical uh, materials, our physical collections in the digital age. And while we're fighting this battle in court, we know that libraries all over the U.S. and all over the world are watching and considering what it means for their practice. So uh, thank you to Spark for hosting this conversation, and thanks uh, to the panelists for uh, giving of your time and your expertise today. I'll hand it back to you, Kathleen. Thanks. 
Thank you so much for that introduction, Chris. We really appreciate that um, to get us started. So our first um, panel presentation is going to be from Sandra, who's going to talk about an overview of the grounding of um, controlled digital lending practices in fair use in the law. Okay, thank you, Kathleen. Um, thank you all for coming today and for having me here. What I want to talk about really quickly is to provide a, a, a grounding sense of like what is controlled digital lending. I know for many of you who are on the call, you've heard the terms. Maybe some of you do totally get it and understand it. I'm talking to the folks who are maybe like not too sure what this is and want to have a better sense of what's happening. And then um, I'm going to turn it over to Kyle, who's going to talk more specifically about the case and how it connects to this grounding. So controlled digital lending encompasses the practice and technology that allows libraries to loan print books to digital patrons in a lend-like print fashion. And this comes from the experts, one of whom is on the call today, Kyle Courtney, from his website, Controlled Digital Lending. I wanted to show a timeline of things that are happening with controlled digital lending. And for those of you who are maybe a little less familiar or somewhat familiar, uh, you may think that this is something that's come about fairly recently. Maybe in 2020 is the first time it really kind of entered your consciousness. But I want to share with you that in 20, uh, 2011, Professor Michelle Wu was talking about this conceptually as digital lending and thinking about how libraries can maximize their collections and maybe solve for some of the issues that we have with collections and providing access to materials that may be out of print, that are orphaned, and still, still have value for our constituents or our, our patrons who want to access that material. And how could we do that in, in a way that would still be have legal um, a legal basis and still be useful for our patrons? So the Internet Archive also started around 2011 with their open library, a digital lending library, following the same kind of procedure of, of providing access to digital patrons of materials that would you know, normally be sitting on a shelf, maybe in some dusty shelf somewhere, and not being accessible to patrons who might make use of it. They followed with partnerships um, at various institutions that wanted to also work on this issue of providing digital access. We've already talked a little bit about the groundbreaking 2018 white paper, which Kyle Courtney did with Dave Hansen, which kind of laid out the case for control digital lending and why it would be useful and practical for libraries of all types to make use of. In 2020, you know, maybe for some of you, first time this came into your, your, your imagination of like what this could be, we're all at home. We, you know, many of us on the call work in libraries. How do we get access to content that's not available as an ebook, not available electronically in any way that people still want to use and make, make use of? For myself, being at an academic institution, we have students, faculty who are wanting to continue their education, continue their research, but no means of doing so without um, relying on digital means or ebooks or um, uh, the like. And if the, the work that you are interested in is not available as an ebook that can be purchased by a library, what do you do? What is your recourse? And many libraries turn to CDL, Controlled Digital Lending, as a way to help our uh, patrons, our, our folks who are using our resources or wanted to use our resources, be able to access this material. Many libraries, you know, came on and, and determined that this was something that was useful and valuable to them as well. And we found internationally that other libraries were also looking at controlled digital lending. We have a statement from IFLA. There is also a statement from the Association of Research Libraries around uh, controlled digital lending in 2022. In 2022 also was the launching of the CDL uh, working group to work on technical standards for people who want to activate controlled digital lending on their campus and also serve as a way to do it interoperably, maybe working with other libraries within a consortium or just coming up with standards for how this can be done. 
So to take a quick step back to talk about the legal basis for CDL, it is a very elegantly designed um, combination of first sale, which is section 109 of US copyright law and fair use. Fair use you all may be quite familiar with, section 107 of US copyright law. So under first sale, this is how libraries are able to operate and function. We are able to acquire books either by purchase or by donation, lawfully made and lawfully acquired books that we can sell, we can lend, we can dispose of however we wish because it has already been paid for and we can make that available to patrons. Looking at fair use, which is a four factor analysis, looking at the purpose and the character of the use. And this is dealing with, is that you, is the use of the person using someone else's copyrighted material? Is that for educational purpose, for commercial, non-commercial purposes? Looking at factor two, what is the what is the nature of the work? Is it published, unpublished, fiction, nonfiction? Factor three talks about the amount and substantial substantiality of the portion and the effect on the current or potential market for the person who created that work or who or who, who is the rights holder for that work. I'm going to pause again to talk about the principles of CDL. Again, it's really dealing with the fact that you have acquired this work lawfully. So you have this book lawfully as part of your collection. It is for physical works that are owned and not for materials that are licensed. Licensed materials are governed by a contract and, and this is something that you will need to adhere to. And this is why we, we like to try to move away from that when we're thinking about control digital lending for physical books. It, and in the the main one of the main principles is the notion of own to loan. So we are because we're working with this you know kind of delicate balance between fair first sale and fair use. We're trying to think about how we can mimic the same way we would work with a physical book and how we would lend that physical book, but translate that to the digital sphere. So we we limit the the use the use of this where if we make a digitized copy and make it available, the physical copy is now removed from circulation so that only one copy is out with a patron when and that copy is out and it's a digital it's at a single uh, with a single user at a time. And it's only for the, the time that we would normally do with physical lending. So if we do for certain types of books, we do a two-hour loan, it's the same two-hour loan. If it's a two-week loan, that's a two-week loan, but it's one-to-one -one each time with maintaining that own-to-loan status. And finally, the a critical part of this is the digital rights management, which prevents wholesale copy, copying and redistribution. I know if nothing else, libraries are very concerned about the rights of authors. They work with authors all the time. They work with vendors and publishers. They are by no means trying to be, um, to let nefarious actors act on, upon things. And they're not trying to um, provide something in a way that, it, that would allow for people to take advantage or to commit copyright infringement. How does fair use and CDL work together? So when we're thinking about the four factors, in fair use with factor one, the purpose, nature and uh, the purpose of the use, there's been a lot of talk about transformation, transformativeness. And does it necessarily have to be transformative, the use of your use of some third party content? And in this particular case, it may or may not be transformative, but it's really important to note that it is non commercial. In most of our cases, in our instances, when we are providing something to a patron for educational purposes or for research, it's, it's non commercial. And, and clearly fulfills the factor one. For factor two, in a lot of cases, when you're looking at factor two, you don't see a lot of information or a lot of uh, drive around the, four, the second factor, which is the nature of the work, unless that work is unpublished. In this instance, we are dealing primarily with published works and, and for, for academic uses, we're also looking at maybe some instances where that work is now out of print, um, has not been print for many, many years, if not decades, and works where they are orphan works, where we are not sure of the status of the work and we're not sure of the author of the work, but this work has been published or made available and someone is interested in having digital access to that material. For factor three on the amount of substantiality, in this instance, of the whole, the entire work is necessary for, for this use. We are lending an entire book just as we would lend an entire physical book. We wouldn't tear out pages of that book and provide it to someone. We would give them the whole book, the whole physical book, and we're doing the same thing here in that one-to-one, own-to-loan um, system. 
And then for factor four, whether there's a market harm for the owner or the author of the work. Again, the work has been paid for, the library has lawfully acquired it or purchased it. Uh, and there really speaks to if that work happens to be out of print or if it's an orphan work, that there, is a, there has been a market failure and that there isn't a market harm because it's actually not even being exploited if it's out of print. It's not being sale, sold in commercial markets or it's not being sold for reasonable prices or it's unavailable if you even try to do a search to try to find that material. So one of the things that I want to, um, before I turn it over to Kyle, is to, to pick up on the point that Chris made on the last factor, which I think uh, Kyle's gonna talk a little bit more about and talk about how the, the, the courts have allowed in instances where the book is not, the work is not available as an ebook, Internet Archive is able to continue lending that work. And so I think that's an important part to think about whether there's that market harm or market failure there. And I want to thank you for your time and attention, and hopefully this helps someone and turn it over to Kyle. Hello. Thanks so much, Sandra. Um, I appreciate that summary. That will help me in my talk um, that I'm going to give here. Uh, this is very important because I also made slides to keep myself on check here. So what we've heard a, a little bit from everyone was, you know, where we're at with the lawsuit, uh, what the order is, and what CDL actually means. So I, my intention here was to uh, do a little bit more um, um, housekeeping here. So, so here's here's what's going on. I just like everyone to remember. This is my weekly reminder to people that ask me about CDL that this is part of a very long process. Chris has been dealing with this for a very long time um, and that we went through all of these stages, right? So the procedural case history, we're up to appeal now. And I, I think that's important, but I want to note that despite that we've gone through discovery and motions and decision and appeal, other fair use copyright cases that were important to our community, including Authors Guild of East Google Books, Authors Guild of Hattie Trust, and Cambridge University Press for Patent, took a very long time to come to a final result. So this is only a district court opinion. This is the lowest level opinion you have in the trifecta that is uh, the law court. So, so, so I just want everyone to understand that. It's going to be a while. We will be doing this for Spark. I'll, I'll throw this out, Nick. We'll do it again next year when we have the appeals. We have all the motions coming in. We have the actually have um, all sorts of other things to talk about. So you know, don't worry about this so much as this is the end of anything. This is, in many ways, phase one. I also want to talk about the final order here. There was uh, uh, there was some aspect of this final order that I thought was very interesting. And Chris mentioned some aspects of this. Um, this order didn't come out right away when the opinion came out. This took five months of negotiations between two parties. Now, normally there are always some negotiations. The court says, okay, go talk about it and determine um, how you're going to put this into action. What's the injunctions with the damage, et cetera. I want to reiterate that the original lawsuit was about 127 books for which they sued in which there was an ebook market. When it came time for negotiations, the publisher said all of the books should be covered. And, and they, they, there was letters about this on either side. So about 1.2 million or so. Chris probably has better numbers than I have. But they wanted millions of books to be removed from the system. And, and IA argued that this type of injunction, and I thought this was a good argument, was not what we litigated in the case. What was litigated was the 127 books for which there was an ebook market. Um, and so, you know, this is a rough number. It's going to change. But they said, well, isn't isn't this only supposed to cover books that are available as licensed eBooks um, currently? So let's say three to 33,000, there's more. And the judge actually sided with Internet Art Archive. So despite that this was a losing fair use analysis um, uh, and the case was lost, nevertheless, the order did some damage control in my mind. And so the judge said, what matters here is that the case did not concern copyrighted works that are not yet available in electronic form. We didn't talk about this. And the only thing that we should cover in this injunctive relief is that uh, copyrighted works like the works in the suit, again, the 127 books for which there was an ebook market that are available from the publishers in electronic form. 
So again, there was this was sort of a, a best case scenario outcoming. So if we look at the final order, and I know Chris mentioned this, damages unknown, that's a private settlement. I'm guessing there's attorney's fees in there as an attorney. I would guess at that. The injunction is that the ebooks were removed from open library. There was 33,000 to start, but those lists are being maintained currently. That's why Chris said he is actively involved in obeying the injunction. And there was this pledge. The pledge is kind of an interesting thing. The injunction states that publishers will notify the Internet Archive about any commercially available ebooks. The Internet Archive has agreed to expeditiously remove them from the Open Library's lending program. The AAP also said, we're not going to take any further actions as long as we maintain this takedown procedure for any AAP member publisher. So again, I think this is a, this is a sort of a injunction win, which is, a, which is an odd and different win. Um, so for those of you that are wondering, was I going to say this or not? CDL is not dead. Far from it. Um, if anything, when Dave Hansen and I uh, completed the white paper, uh, we imagined a universe that looks a little bit like this injunction. Now, what's great about the CDL is that it is an umbrella, right? CDL has lots of different flavors. There's the open libraries flavor. There's the Boston Library Consortium flavor. There's the the, the reserves flavor, um, which welcomes a lot of flexibility under the tent of CDL. So in, in that regard, when Dave and I wrote the white paper in 2018, we actually imagined something that looks like this injunction, which is libraries have been collecting books for, you know, a very long time. And we have built up collections that are worth, you know, millions, if not tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars across the United States. The vast majority of those books have not made the jump to digital. And we know this because our rough approximation of what was in open libraries and what was available on ebook was like, you know, 6% or less or some kind of small number. And because books that we have collected may not be popular and do not have um, uh, an ability to be marketed in any way, um, because, you know, they just, there's no new editions, there's no things, they're copyrighted, there's a million reasons, but they're on our shelves and they're not likely to make the jump to digital for a number of, of capitalistic market reasons, right? But libraries are not a function of that mission of profit-based motivations for making things available. So the idea is that this injunction gets back to what I think is the core of CDL, uh, which is making our collections available to the widest audience possible, our patrons, in furtherance of research, scholarship, general learning, literacy, et cetera, and that we're not harming the market by doing that. And again, if these are on our shelves and no one else is going to digitize them and make them available, then it's up to us to do that. Um, and as Sandra alluded to, there's no market harm, especially with some of those works that have not made the jump to digital, nor are likely to. We're not going to you know, interfere with that, not to mention the loan of a book itself in the physical space is a natural market harm that Congress has legislated for, right? That idea is that I could go buy this at a bookstore or I can borrow it from my local library. You know, every loan of a book is not a lost sale. These are two different universes that exist. The library's access-driven universe, which, you know, fundamentally promotes copyright as well because we buy the books and acquire them and loan them, but also the, the for-profit mission, which is if you can afford to buy a book, you will, and many people do. Many people take library books out, like it enough, they want to buy it. But again, there's plenty of room in the middle there. Um, and so I just want to be very clear on that. The other thing was I, I was asked, and, and kindly I wanted to, to, to tell a little tale. Nick asked me just to have a quick, there was another little copyright case, which is interesting about libraries, which came up. So I'm going to deviate from CDL just for the moment. But a section of the Copyright Act that deals with deposits in the Library of Congress uh, was declared unconstitutional recently. Um, and it's probably a section that you don't uh, aren't aware of, but Section 407 of the Copyright Law um, it requires, with certain exceptions, that each copyrighted work published in the U.S. be deposited with the Library of Congress. Now, registration, when you register a copyright, it can include a deposit, but a deposit can be made without registration as well. Failing to make a deposit 
does not re result in loss of copyright, but may result in loss of fines. I'm uh, sorry, may result in fines. So uh, Valancourt Books is a small on-demand publisher that focuses mostly on public domain and other works. And they got a series of demand letters from the Copyright Office saying, hey, you have to uh, give us physical copies, you know? And Valancourt said, well, no, wait a minute now. There's an inherent conflict here because the mandate is not specifically a condition for the rights holder to get copyright. We get copyright the moment it's automatic and protected, et cetera. And they were basically putting covers on and in intros and had limited copyright, so they didn't want to register their copyright. Well, they said this was a violation of the First Amendment and the Fifth Amendment because it was an unjustified takings of someone else's property without just compensation. And that's the idea, the taking clause, like you can't just take stuff. And so they viewed the Copyright Office demand for deposit as a takings of their work without um, without being compensated, right? Because they were like, give us this for free. So the DC Circuit Court of Appeals agreed with this Fifth Amendment takings claim. They didn't get into the First Amendment issues. And they said, it represented an uncompensated taking of private property under the takings clause. That's a pretty major decision. Now, uh, you know, is this going to cause problems? I'm not, I'm not freaking out about it here at my life, right? But it does have an interesting thing about the future of deposit, the future of the Library of Congress's role in deposit, and its relation to copyright. Um, I mean, because a section of the Copyright Act was declared unconstitutional. So this is kind of an interesting thing. I just wanted to explain this because Nick asked me to, but I'm going to stop now uh, and turn it over to Kathleen to tell me who goes next. <laughs> so next we have um, Charlie Barlow here to tell us about the um, new initiatives coming from the Boston Library Consortium around controlled digital lending. Sorry, I could not find my unmute button for the life of me there. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so BLC has been uh, investigating um, CDL for ILL uh, as a consortium since uh, fall of 2020. And I'm here today um, to review a little bit of our work so far and give you a quick preview of putting Project Reshare for CDL as a mechanism for interlibrary loan uh, into practice and a little bit on where we're headed uh, next. Um, so I always like to begin these presentations with um, some version of this slide, given that familiarity with CDL varies. Uh, this really is just outlining some of the core principles of CDL as described in uh, Kyle and Dave's uh, 2018 white paper on CDL for library books. And Sandra covered this in much more detail uh, earlier in uh, today's webcast. Um, so let's turn to the ILL use case itself. Uh, with interest increasing uh, in this space over the last several years, a group of us, and Kyle again was included at this table, uh, we co-authored a statement on using controlled digital lending as a mechanism for interlibrary loan back in 2021. Um, we developed the statement for several reasons. The first was really to increase awareness of CDL in the interlibrary loan context. The second was to affirm libraries' rights to use CDL. And the third was to improve the services provided by the resource sharing community by ensuring that libraries and consortia are operating with the same set of assumptions and principles. Uh, to date, about 40 libraries and consortia and allied organizations have endorsed this statement and you all should consider doing so uh, as well. Um, the document includes uh, 10 foundational statements, and I've included three of them uh, on this slide for you. Uh, so one of the most significant early obstacles to BLC's work was really the absence of technical solutions to facilitate our aspirations for CDL for interlibrary loan. Uh, my colleagues, Nathan Mealy at Wesleyan University and Michael Rodriguez, who was then at UConn and now at Lyricis, uh, wrote this post in the Scholarly Kitchen uh, back in 2021. And 
While there have certainly been some advancements in supporting CDL for local use cases, the course reserve piece and so on, there really aren't solutions in the market that support the consortial CDL use case uh, at scale. Uh, that said, um, I don't think that get, getting started with CDL for ILL necessarily needs to be terribly fancy. And I was actually really inspired just last month at the Northwest ILL conference, uh, there was a presentation from the Tulsa Community Colleges Access Services Office, and they'd created CDL for ILL workflows by uh, leveraging a SharePoint site and then putting expiring links and download controls for ILL requests uh, that came through uh, OCLC's uh, TAPASA system. And I'll drop a link to that uh, into the chat uh, afterwards. Um, so back to BLC, about a year of investigations later, we shared our plans in September of 21 uh, to implement CDL as a mechanism for ILL. And the report is certainly worth reading, but uh, the key takeaways were largely those that I've touched on today. Uh, the first, that CDL is an extension of existing resource sharing practices. The second, around um, the commercial technology market being largely unresponsive to libraries' aspirations. And then the third, uh, that the solution appears to be a consortial approach so that we can scale the impact of that solution and scale investment to help resource it. And that is really what brought us to uh, Project Reshare. Um, so Project Reshare for BLC was really the obvious choice for us to move ahead with these aspirations for CDL for ILL. We were drawn uh, to things like the library-led development and governance models at Reshare, uh, it being an open source software, uh, its support for consortial resource sharing uh, based on interoperability standards, ISO 18626, and of course, it being highly scalable, um, adding one consortia or multiple consortia at a time is far more efficient than one library at a time. And so in fall of 21, at the same time that we published that report, uh, our board of directors here at BLC committed $100,000 to accelerate development of CDL capabilities within Project Reshare's platform. And since then, other libraries and consortia have joined us in contributing financial support and in-kind support uh, in making uh, the solution uh, a reality. And here is where we're at today. Uh, we spent a significant amount of time this past year scoping out a roadmap uh, for Reshare CDL. Wherever possible, we really wanted to build upon existing infrastructure and functionality in the Reshare platform rather than building an entirely new service. Uh, if you remember my presentation title of Making CDL Boring, uh, that certainly stands true uh, here. But our solution builds upon the existing reshare returnables infrastructure for physical books. It's already in use by consortia and groups like Palsy, like Connect New York, TRLN, and Ivy Plus to facilitate interlibrary loan uh, of physical materials. And building upon reshare uh, returnables for CDL makes good sense because functionally CDL is digital returnables. Um, so then we turned our focus uh, over the last several months towards developing a minimum viable product and integrating it with a shared repository solution that was central to doing this at a consortial scale. Um, development will continue over the next months and even years to bring enhanced functionality and make refinements that are responsive uh, to patrons. Um, in the wake of the summary judgment, BLC did elect to temporarily scale back our early adopters program. Originally, we had planned uh, to implement with four to six libraries. Uh, right now we have two libraries using the system uh, with two different ILSs uh, to focus primarily on software testing and give us a little time uh, to continue to learn from folks like those that are joining me uh, on the panel today. Uh, but I am really grateful to Tufts University and to UMass Chan Medical School for their leadership on this testing component. Um, in winter 2024, we expect we'll be ready for a broader implementation uh, we hope to see other libraries and consortia implement Reshare for CDL with us uh, in phases every winter and summer over the next couple of years. Um, and now I'm going to show you a little bit around how Reshare works. Um, so the discovery layer uh, at the library provides search across the library and the consortial holdings and is really the interface for patrons' library requests, much the same as it is for books. Uh, Reshare tracks and manages those requests. Um, identifies the supplier, orchestrates staff workflow, and then integrates with the ILS for handling physical materials, authenticating patrons, and then maintaining that crucial own to loan ratio. Haiku, the repository, manages files and provides temporary controlled access to those digital materials. 
And then upon authorization, Risha will send a URL of the material to the patron where they can gain access to that digital loan. Uh, so now we are in Reshare. Uh, this screen shows uh, an overview of incoming returnables requests. Uh, in a consortium that is using Risha both for physical and digital, you'd see all of those requests together. But as I mentioned, we're simply testing the software right now. So all you see are incoming uh, digital requests. Um, as I said, Reshare integrates with uh, an open source Haiku institutional repository solution. This is a, a variant of Samvera. It's used to store digital objects of scanned physical library materials. And what we're seeing here on this screen is the document submission page in Haiku. This is where a library staff member can add metadata and upload a PDF of that scanned book. The repository would then break up the PDF into pages that can later be served to the patron through a controlled access book viewer. Uh, the repository is really central to, to BLC's consortial CDL implementation at any scale. Uh, we're taking the approach of once a title has been scanned once, any member of the consortium that holds a physical copy that corresponds precisely to it can use that digital asset as the basis for a CDL loan provided that the physical material is appropriately uh, sequestered. Um, and now back to one of those incoming uh, requests from earlier. Uh, at this stage, uh, the request has been approved and a librarian has retrieved it, retrieved the book and digitized it. Um, the physical material will, will be automatically checked out of the ILS to mark it unavailable for other borrowers. And the last step remaining on this screen is to input a URL of that digital material. In future releases, we're planning for previously scanned materials to be automatically associated with requests if they exist in the Haiku repository. But for now, uh, this is a manual step. And then after entering that URL, the patron will receive an email containing the URL and that will take them to the book uh, that they have borrowed. And here we go. Uh, a book in the book reader itself. We're using the IIIS standard to serve books out of the Haiku repository controlled so that only a valid borrower with an open loan on that particular book uh, has access. Uh, so that really is sort of reshare in a nutshell, but I'll end with a word on where we're headed uh, next. Um, so earlier this summer, BLC received a national leadership grant for libraries from the IMLS. Uh, this funding is intended to support startup costs associated with implementing consortial CDL using Project Reshare and also funding our resource sharing program manager for an additional 18 months. And during that time, our goal really is to promote the widespread adoption of CDL at scale through engagement with libraries and consortia, advocacy with library technology vendors, and the production of free and open resources in a consortial CDL toolkit to guide future implementations of Project Reshare. In the latter stages of the project, we're looking to convene a national audience as part of a two-day CDL summit to discuss future directions and strategies to scale uh, adoption. And with that, that is a wrap. Thanks. Thank you everyone for that really in-depth overview of CDL, where we came from all the way up to where we think we're going. Um, just to kind of kick off our uh, time for discussion here, I actually was hoping that the audience would give us some feedback on where you are right now. Um, so now, let's see, I think I can launch this poll for everyone. Ooh. <laughs> So we're kind of curious about what you're up to with CDL um, folks who are here with us today. We forgot the uh, Jeopardy music to uh, play in the background. <laughs> are we supposed to play like royalty free or AI generated music? I was gonna say, um, you know, I know some composers if we wanna <laughs> commission some music. Give folks another few seconds here. Looks like we might be wrapping up. Oh, every time I'm thinking we're done, we get some more responses. 
We have a quorum at least. All right. Thank you, everyone. This is actually super interesting and I think um, fascinating for us to see who is doing what, what decisions are being made. I think um, it's particularly interesting to see that there's not a whole lot of folks who have decided to change their track on CDL um, because of concerns about legal risk, which I think is um, interesting context to our conversation today. All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, so I think um, one of the things that we're interested in um, from the panel is, you know, what other kinds of common questions you're hearing from libraries that you're talking to and any regular misconceptions that you feel um, you're constantly having to respond to or not even constantly um, responding to about CDL. Uh, I, I reiterated one of these in my slides, but I'll say it again. CDL is not dead. <laughs> it's been around for a long time. It's, it's as far as I can tell, it is ingrained into a lot of library consideration as a means of considering access in a different way. So I think it is fully another arrow in the quiver of services that we have currently. It's not gonna answer all things. It never was intended to answer all things, but it gives you another viable solution for those collections, which I think are rare, unique, local, that have little to zero market harm, but have high value to communities outside of this, including those that can't get to the library, um, you know, print disabled, et cetera, for deploy. So I, I, I think, that's what I want to say. It's, it's, it seems like it's here to stay. They're issuing grants about this, right? We just saw some. They're, they're continuing to study it. Sandra and I are on the NISO thing. They're inventing a technical standard for it. So it's going to be around um, in different ways, I think, in the future. So that's what I'm saying a lot of the time. So, um... Are there any other comments from the panel? We do have a question um, from one of our audience members as for Charlie asking um, how the recent changes at ReShare um, involving EBSCO are changing the shape of your project, if at all. Uh, it's a great question. I wouldn't say that there's been you know, any profound impact on that. Of course, we're sad to see our consortial colleagues go in another direction and you know, I think Speaking personally, it does really divide very limited library resources in two directions, but the CDL work that's been done to date is fully funded and we're well resourced for future phases. Um, and I'm looking forward to the launch of those future phases and more and more libraries and consortia implementing the solution. There's another question in the Q&A asking if anybody can speak to the status of CDL with Hobby Trust. So, <laughs> so Hobby Trust um, has a CDL-like loaning system. I don't think they would call it CDL. Um, I want to be very clear on that. Uh, however, it is inspirational in that uh, for those of you that were here uh, during the time of the emergency temporary access system, ETOS, um, Hathi Trust provided one-to-one own-to-loan ratio of the books if you were in that library and you had to log in and it expired after, I think it was an hour, and you can renew if no one was behind you. Um, so it's it's the emergency temporary access service is not running anymore. The, the national healthcare emergency was declared over. Um, but nevertheless, it gave us a really interesting window into how they did it, which, by the way, was a result of the Google v. Happy Trust decision, right? We wouldn't be in that position unless we won that fair use case earlier. Um, so they are continuing to maintain their collections and their partner libraries can look and see stuff uh, and they're doing their uh, public domain assessments. They're doing a lot of good work, but the ETOS system stepped up. I see Sandra's unmuting. Oh yeah, and I was yep, just gonna add, you know, ETOS stopped or you were no longer eligible for ETOS even as a member library if your library was open. 
So um, I think for for a, a lot of folks, I mean, Hati, look, they already have very tight controls of, on access and how people can access um, and following through on provisions from some of the litigation that comes about. If someone has accessibility issues, they're able to provide access to them um, for accessibility. So I think, you know, they're there are definitely some distinctions and I definitely agree with Kyle that they would not call it themselves. They would not call it controlled digital lending, but you can see how it is, is, is a flavor of that. So there's another question from David Perry um, asking if folks on the panel are concerned that during the appeals process for the hatchet case that um, courts might expand any potential injunction. Um, and kind of go in the opposite direction of the narrow injunction that we saw at the district court level. Sorry, I'm reading the question. <laughs> <laughs> I think the question is, are you worried that there might be a worse decision um, in appeal? Worse for libraries. <laughs> I mean, there's always possibility of worse. I, I maybe I'm an optimist, and I'm thinking what Chris said that there were errors of facts and law in there that need to be rectified or remedied. It could be better too. Let's. I realize, you know, I'm I'm an optimist about all of this. Um, so, sure, potentially when you go on appeal, that opens it up, especially if they review the facts to Nova or something like that. But uh, I'm interested in fixing what I think the decision got wrong, especially. And by the way, that doesn't just apply to Internet Archive. That applies to all of us. Mm -hmm. um, I have concerns about a Donate Now button being regarded as commercial activity with regards to the fair use assessment. I have concerns that they missed some very important case law in the Second Circuit about what a commercial market harm is. Um, you know, there's, I think there's, there's some fodder there, uh, to be discussed. And that's why I think many of us on this call are interested in filing amicus briefs to the second circuit to discuss those things from the library's perspective, but also saving fair use for, for the libraries as well. I'll just say that, um, I think for, for most people, you know, whether you're a lawyer or you follow legal cases, whatever, you can really never predict <laughs> what, a court is going to do. Um, and so, you know, like like Kyle, I am optimistic. Um, I mean, I was also optimistic before the, the decision came down too. So, I mean, I'm still, I remain optimistic. Um, I do agree that, you know, that there is some something to, to be said about this, the decision around like the commercial um, use or how they, how uh, the judge made that commercial argument for Internet Archive. And then, you know, because a lot of us, you know, we accept donations. Are we also um, having a commercial use, even though we are at nonprofit institutions? So, yeah, definitely a question that I would love to see a, a different resolution to. We also had a question if anyone uh, would be willing to tackle the idea or just kind of revisit this idea that digitizing a whole book can be a fair use. Where would we be without the, the third factor allowing the flexibility for stuff, right? We wouldn't have text and data mining or engrams or the Google Books project or, uh, you know, uh, there's a million decisions uh, out there where sometimes you have to do the whole thing to allow the new transformative use right i mean yeah i mean in the in the notes that i was mentioning earlier you know we we have the information about transformation in the first factor and and how you know how important is it's always led to be but it's not always the you know what's needed but in a particular instance where you are doing text and data mining or you are providing you know in this case access to a book at the same way you would act provide access to a to a, um a physical book you put providing in a digital way um you know that is transformative and so i think that in that case, you need the whole book to be able to do it like you can't do it with a portion of it like i said we're not we don't give out just like tear out the book and give them to, that to people when they come and they want to check out the whole book. So, you know, in the case for uh, CDL, we should do the same. It's trying to emulate that same process um, that we do in the physical world. 
I, I love that analogy, Sandra, though. We, we don't rip out just two pages and like let them just take the two pages that they want to cite. Um, it's, it's such a good reminder of the way that, that we need to work with information and think about things. And so the use cases that IA has for this are very interesting, right? So <clears throat> I love the, the five second loan, if it even is a loan, like, uh, and I'm speaking for Chris here, but people that are dialing in, flipping through that thing real fast, be like, there's the site and then getting out. They needed the whole book to flip through, you know, mm -hmm. and I think, Sandra, that's a perfect analogy for that kind of blue link citation aspect that Internet Archive has. Yeah, and we, we, all of us on the call, we work at places where we might have the only thing and somebody just needs to know, did they say something about blue socks on page six? <laughs> and that's it. That's all they need to know. And they need the whole book to be able to do that search, which is, you know, how we came with those decisions with Google Books, too, you know. Well, we are just about at time. So I want to thank all of our panelists so much for joining us today and sharing their expertise. I want to thank Nick and Spark for um, providing a forum for us to have this conversation. And I look forward to um, continuing this conversation with all of you.